Hello everyone and welcome back to another wonderful uh, biology IA test review video. The topics on this test are the cell cycle, mitosis, and cancer. And feel free as usual to put this video on two times speed. I can only talk so quickly and there are a lot of topics to be covered today. So in order the topics I will be covering are DNA structure, mainly supercoiling, interphase, mitosis, electrophoresis, and cyclins, as well as then we'll go into cancer. All right, so let's get right into it. So supercoiling, what is it? Well, it has to deal with DNA, obviously. So we're going to be in this entire time today talking about eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have linear DNA with histone proteins. When that DNA is with those proteins, it's called chromatin. And it can be said that chromatin usually looks like uh, beads on a string. And the reason that it looks like that is because some parts of the DNA needs to be unwound. That, those would be the string part. And they're used for replication or transcription or anything really. And the parts that look like the beads are going to be where we're thinking of the uh, winding to ha being happening, right? That's where the coiling is. So supercoiling refers to this chromatin or this DNA being wrapped extremely tightly around these histones so that the cell can undergo mitosis. It makes it easier for the chromosome to be pulled apart into those sister chromatids and it keeps everything from getting damaged because if you have like a big mess of DNA and you're trying to pull it apart, it's not going to go real well because you've got that big mess. So instead, what we do is supercoil it. Now supercoiling is going to be what we see in this picture here, where it's wrapped around each nucleosome two times and then it just keeps going. So we might have a nucleosome, it'll go two times. We might have another nucleosome, it'll go another two times, so on and so forth. So let's go over some of the important vocabulary that we need to know for supercoiling. So we've already talked about chromatin, but let's just review it very quickly. It's going to be DNA with protein histones, right? Chromosomes are going to be that supercoiled DNA. And again, that's going to have that like signature kind of chromosome look, the X. And then we also have our sister chromatid, and that's going to be one half of that X is going to be the sister chromatid. And then we'll have another exactly the same one over here, right? And then we have the nucleosome, which is what I was talking about prior. That's the dark purple here. And that's just going to be what the DNA wraps around so that it can supercoil. It, it helps it to. And again, the DNA is going to coil around each nucleosome two times, and then there will be multiple nucleosomes that they go around. Now, that was not a super in-depth look at supercoiling, but that's really the basis of it, and I can't see how much more in-depth we could get with this exam. So then, then let's talk about interphase. So interphase is where the cell is going to spend the majority of its life, and... It's kind of the largest chunk of the cell cycle, almost, right? I mean, it, it definitely is. So in this picture, we have mitosis, which is over here, and the rest of this is all interphase. What's kind of important to think about is that while this is where the cell is going to spend the most of its life, it's not doing necessarily a whole lot right here. So it is going to go through G1, S, and G2, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's doing very much. It's just mostly growing um, and resting. So at each of these small circles here, we've got what I would consider to be like a checkpoint. And we'll talk about them more in depth with cyclins, but it is important to recognize them because we hit our first checkpoint here at G1. And what this is gonna do is if there's problems at G1, we're gonna go into G0. And this is the only place where that can happen where we could go into G0. And what happens here is that we wait for either 
more resources to become available, the DNA to repair itself, the cell to have like, if the body is starving, then we need more nutrients to have our cells replicate, then that's what it's doing there. And if the cichlins determine that the cell cannot keep going on, it cannot move forward, then it's going to go what is, through what is called apoptosis. Apoptosis is going to be cell death or cell suicide. I definitely didn't spell that right. But I just like to call it programmed cell death. Because it's basically when the cell is going to be told, you need to die now, you're causing problems. So we see this not just in G0, we can see this anywhere, but it is especially common in G0 just because of the nature of that stage. Moving right along, in the rest of the G1 phase, aside from just uh, that checkpoint and going into G0, what's going to be happening is mainly growth. The cell is going to get a lot bigger, the organelles are going to be copied, and the cell is going to get, make molecules that it might need for replication. Then when we move into S, we're going to be synthesizing a copy of the DNA or replicating that DNA. And that's what we were talking about earlier with the supercoiling where it might be kind of unwound. That's where that's happening. And there's also a copy of the centrosome being made here. Right. So then we go into G2, which is our second grow phase. Again, we're getting bigger here. The cell is making proteins and organelles, and it might be reorganizing itself, getting ready for what comes next, which is mitosis. And then here we also have metabolic reactions. And this is going to be like, what we need to think about when we think of metabolic reactions is not just what is happening in the cycle, but it's also just what the cell needs to do to get through its regular life. So the most common of which are going to be cellular respiration, which is going to be in both animals and plants, and photosynthesis, which is exclusively in plant cells, right? So I think that's the main part of interphase covered. So then let's move on to mitosis. Mitosis is a big topic in this unit, so we're going to do it in a few parts here. So first, we're just going to go over an overview. So what is mitosis? Well, it's basically when the nucleus of the cell divides, just the nucleus. The rest of the cell dividing is going to be called cytokinesis. That would be like the cytoplasm and the organelles splitting and dividing into two cells. Everything except the nucleus, right? So this is going to occur, again, right after interphase. And if you want kind of a depiction of what the cell will look like during interphase, that's right here. This is going to be important when we look at kind of calculating our mitotic index and such because there's just a lot going on in all the others. But here we are going to have a mostly dark kind of nucleus and it's going to be a pretty simple cell. It's just the main thing to remember is that there's not you're not going to see any coils or any X's or any situations with the, uh, with the DNA in the nucleus. It's just going to be kind of dark and simple. And again, this is going to occur simultaneously with cytokinesis, which is again where the rest of the cell is dividing other than the nucleus. And then the result of mitosis and cytokinesis is going to be two identical daughter cells. So then let's go over mitosis. A lot going on here, but let's take it step by step. Prophase is going to come first. There's no really easy way to remember this. It's just, if you want to think maybe pro, pre, and pre is pre the rest of the steps. But this is where you're going to be able to see a few of those spindle fibers. A few of those spindle fibers like we have here. You're going to be able to see more of that uh, kind of chromosomey look within the nucleus. This is when that nuclear membrane goes away, so you're not going to be able to see that clearly in an electron photograph, but you can see it in drawings, and you can and should draw it if you're ever asked to. Again, those mitotic spindles or spindle fibers are forming. That DNA is condensing and supercoiling like we had talked about previously. And this is where animal cells will like count themselves and sort themselves and figure their lives out. 
And again, these are drawings of animal cells, but it's going to be essentially the same process for uh, plant cells too. So we move on to metaphase, and the easiest way to identify this is it's where all of the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. Those spindle fibers are going to be attached to each chromosome ready to, at the centromere, which is kind of, if we think of the chromosome like this, the centromere is going to be right there, and it's where the cell can be pulled apart, I believe. And again, those chromatids are lining in the middle, and that nuclear membrane obviously is totally gone. So again, if you're asked to identify this, then the easiest way is to look for that uh, X formation in a straight line in the middle. Anaphase is when those sister chromatids are pulled apart. So they go from being like this to separated, right? And they're going to move to the poles, which is just a fancy way of saying opposite sides. And the nuclear membranes in telophase, those nuclear membranes are starting to reform as the chromosomes decondense and stop being so tightly supercoiled. And two separate nuclei are forming so that the cell can split. And here you also see the cell kind of pinching in because we're looking at that uh, animal cell. This is going to be slightly different in plant cells. So let's talk about this next. So mitotic index, which we, I had mentioned previously, mitotic index is going to be finding like the percentage or the amount of cells that are in mitosis. So the way that you're going to do that is with this formula here. You're going to find the number of cells in mitosis and divide it by the total number of cells. So you could be asked to do this using a picture of a group of cells that are in the middle of living their lives and going through mitosis or interphase. And the main use of this is to know how many cells are dividing, which can be an indicator of a lot of conditions, including cancer. And the, reason, the way that we can do this with cancer and the reason why it's important is by looking at a typical, like if we're talking about lung cancer, by looking at a typical regular mitotic index for lung cancer and comparing it to someone's mitotic index in their lung cells, then what we can determine, determine, determine is whether or not those cells are dividing too often. If too many of them are in mitosis, then too much division is happening. And that could indicate that there is a problem causing uncontrolled, uh, uncontrolled division, which would again be that mitosis. So then let's look at cytokinesis, which again is happening simultaneously as uh, mitosis, which is why I just threw it in with the mitosis group. And this is going to be the division of everything aside from the nucleus in the cell. So for animals, that's going to be the furrow pinching inwards, which is what we kind of saw earlier. But for plants, it's going to be a little bit different. So if this is our plant cell, we've got a nucleus here and a nucleus here. We're going to start having this like cell plate as it's called. And that cell plate is going to form in the center and then it's going to kind of split off causing there to be two separate cells because naturally plant cells are already kind of linked together very tightly. That's just all it needs to do. Whereas plant, whereas animal cells pinch off and then kind of separate from one another, right? So if we have the animal cells that would kind of be like this and then they'd pinch off and then they'd go their separate ways, right? They don't need to be friends forever. Moving right along, we have electrophoresis. So this is kind of a bigger topic, but let's just jump into it, right? So electrophoresis is going to be used to separate proteins or fragments of DNA according to size. So how does it do that? Well, let's back up. Let's talk about restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes are going to be able to cut DNA at specific sequences. So this might be like we see in these two pictures here. It might be at the CCC break GGG, 
right? Fine, simple. They originated from bacteria that use them to protect against viruses by cutting off specific parts of their DNA. So the way that we can use them as scientists is by separating coding and non-coding regions or just separating parts of DNA. And the way that you'll see this potentially on the test is that you may be asked to draw these division lines like I have here. Or you may be given like a circle and be given numbers at A, B, C, and D or whatever and be told that uh, maybe uh, a specific enzyme cuts A, Z, cuts zero through A, how many fragments are there and how big are the fragments? So you know that there would be two fragments because this is one and this is two. And you know that one would be 120 because that's zero to 120. And the other would be 430 divided by 120, or minus, sorry, minus 120. And so you would get 310, right? Not too hard, but just keep in mind that you probably want to draw out every single time so that you're getting a better sense of how many fragments there are and how many numbers you need to find because I think that's the most challenging part about these problems is when you're looking at a circle it's kind of kind of complicated to see where it's going to split. So then let's talk about blunt versus sticky ends. So blunt ends are going to be where the DNA is split flat, right? So this right here I would consider a flat split Keep in mind that you want to look and see that the parts of the cell that you're looking at are going to be exactly opposite. This is going to be a sticky end. And the reason I say this is because it is not exactly even. It's kind of blunt. Right? And so this would be where that DNA is still cutting at the same point. It would be the GA or the GA, right, on both sides. But it's not going to be blunt like the other one. So you have to kind of also consider when you're putting these pieces back together is that offset ends that match are going to be able to go together. So these sticky ends, if they go together like G goes with C, A goes with T, A goes with T, T goes with A, T goes with A, C goes with G, that's good, right? But you might have a situation where you have A and C or... T and, T and G, and they would not go together. And so then in that situation, those pieces would be from separate sticky end splits. Even ends will always be able to go together, more or less. They will always have their opposite pair, but it's not as restricted as with the sticky ends. So all of this leads up to being able to use electrophoresis for several reasons, several uses, but parental identification or paternal tests and um, crime scene analysis are some of the biggest ones. So electrophoresis again works by using a buffer, a gel, some electricity, and some dyed DNA and separating that DNA by length. So by running an electric current through this DNA that you have chopped, chopped up using your restriction enzyme, you are able to separate the DNA by length. And because that DNA is dyed, you can look inside the little like electrophoresis box basically and see where it lines up. So I've drawn us, a, drawn us out a pretty little example here that we can look at together. So if A is going to be our um, sample from, let's pretend it's a sample from a crime scene and B and C are our two suspects. We know that because A lines up with suspect C, that must be the criminal, right? Or the person that was at the crime scene. So what is the process kind of of electrophoresis and using it for parental DNA or forensic analysis? So first we need to use these VNTRs, which are tandem repeats. These are essentially common in every single person. They are non-coding regions, meaning that we do not use them to code for any proteins or anything, which causes them to be less likely to be damaged because they're not being exposed or out of that coiling very often. 
They are also, the VNTRs are unique to each specific person, which is useful because we don't want to mistake someone for somebody else. So the fact that they're unique makes them helpful for crime scene analysis because every single person is going to have a different sequence. So PCR is the process of uh, taking a small piece of DNA, maybe it's a cheek swab or a piece of hair or um, some skin cells, and using that um, DNA and replicating it over and over and over so you have a, a lot of that DNA to look at, like a, a larger quantity. We do this with the VNTRs, and then we're able to use electrophoresis maybe from the crime scene and any suspects we have, or from the child and a known parent and any unknown parents. So, for example, with the child, if we have the mom's DNA and we have the baby's DNA, then we can take any potential fathers and test their DNA. And maybe uh, in this imaginary world, this is what the baby's DNA looks like. And we know this is mom. So we know this has to be dad because the baby's DNA is a perfect combination of the two, right? Because the VNTRs are inherited from your parents. And that also makes them helpful from the standpoint of using them to identify who the parent is, is that there's always going to be a combination match from parents to baby. All right, let's talk about cichlins. So we talked about cichlins briefly before when we looked at, um, we looked at interphase and mitosis and the whole cycle, but let's talk quickly about how they work. So when the cell reaches a checkpoint, it is going to send up a red flag that says, hey, we need to make sure everything's going okay. Can someone come over here and look at this and tell us that we don't need to go through apoptosis or if this is G1, we don't need to go into G0 to rest for a bit. And so cichlin will hop over and go, do, 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 okay, I can look. And once cichlin kind of determines that everything's okay, it's going to bond with something called CD CDK. And this is going to signal that the checkpoint is cleared and it's going to allow the cell to keep moving forward with the cell cycle. So there are three checkpoints that require cichlin and there are four types of cichlin. So four, the three checkpoints are going to be G1, G2, and M. And at these points, obviously the cichlin is going to come over and it's going to check everything out. And when you see that happening, you can kind of determine where in the cell cycle a cell is based on what their cyclin levels look like because one type of cyclin will always be going on. So if this is our graph, one type of cyclin is always going to be there. Another type of cyclin will spark at the end of G, G2. A third type of cyclin will kind of happen for G, or sorry, G1, G2. And then the fourth type of cyclin will spike at M. So this is how you can kind of tell where exactly we are in the cycle, right? Is because you can determine using these cyclins. So it's also kind of interesting to think about that the discovery of cyclins was an accident. And this is on the review sheet, but it, it's not something we specifically talked about in class, but I'll just review it because I think it's kind of a funny story. So... Um, our teachers talked about how cyclins mean cycle, and they do, but they technically mean cycling because the person who discovered them discovered them by accident when he was study studying the life cycle of sea urchins, and he found these cyclins. He found the uh, like information and data about them and kind of understood how they worked with the life cycle of cells and whatnot. And he named them after his love of cycling, which I thought was just funny because the guy likes to bike, determines like a groundbreaking thing in DNA and uh, cell cycle. And is like, yeah, I like to bike. Let's name it that. All right, dude, whatever. So finally, let's move on to cancer. So we're going to start out with a bit of vocabulary. So carcinogens are going to mutate DNA, and that's going to result in a tumor. Benign tumors are non-cancerous, whereas malignant tumors are cancerous, and they are classified as malignant 
by their ability to break through their boundaries to adjoining tissues. So what I mean by this is that if you have lung cancer and it's able to break through its boundary and invade different parts of the body, right? That is different from metastasis, sorry, metastasis, because metastasis is kind of like the ending term of cancer. And this is going to be when a tumor spreads to a new place in the body, usually through the bloodstream. So if you have breast cancer, this might be when the breast cancer moves to your lungs or moves to your um, muscles. And we find, we don't just find a new tumor there, we find breast cancer cells there, right? So the main causes of this are going to be mutated proto-oncogenes, which just turns them into oncogenes. And that's going to be kind of like a gas pedal. So by mutating this, we turn the back gas pedal all the way on. It makes it very, very difficult to stop uh, the cell from just repeatedly... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Repeatedly dividing. That's a word. Repeatedly diving, dividing because the gas pedal is always on. We also have... Tumor suppressor genes, which do as this name sounds, and kind of helps us suppress tumors and helps us be like, whoa, whoa there, buddy, slow down. They kind of work as a brake pedal. And when they um, are s mutated, there is no brake pedal, and the, the car just keeps going or the, the cell just keeps dividing. And then what causes cancer specifically? Well, we think it, it takes about 60 mutations of the DNA to start causing cancer. And so the multiple hit theory kind of explains to us why people who are older have a likelihood of catching cancer that is higher or getting cancer that is higher than younger people because throughout daily life we are just exposed to carcinogens or mutagens and that's normal. And we all accumulate DNA damage and that's okay. And as people get older, as they're exposed to more of these things, the mutagens, mutations in the DNA and damage kind of adds up to the point where it reaches that 60 level, kind of naturally, unnaturally, right? And that, that I believe is called the multiple hit theory, but I could be incorrect. But there is an accumulation of mutation over time, and that mutation is what causes cancer. Which brings us to our last point of the day already wow and that is going to be smoking and kind of correlation versus causation so i'm sure we've all heard the phrase that correlation doesn't always equal causation so why is this kind of important well if it's a sunny day it's a sunny day i love sunny days no i don't um and, okay it's a sunny day and there is more ice cream being sold, right? The sun didn't cause more ice cream to be sold. It's hot. And people like ice cream when they're hot. And this is what causes ice cream to be sold, right? The sun being out did not magically cause ice cream sales to go up. It's the uh, heat that was caused by the sun that causes people to want more ice cream. So that's kind of the theory behind causation does not equal, or causation is not necessarily the same as correlation. Correlation does not equal causation. So what we can do to kind of look at this is by using Pearson's R, or R value. And this is going to tell us the correlation value, how strongly two things are correlated. By determining, going through the math, and finding out this R value, we can look like we did, um, we have previously, can compare it to how high we kind of need to think about the data being before we can consider something correlated versus something being caused. When that value is high enough, we know that there is a higher likelihood of there being a link between the two variables, right? The likelihood goes up that one is causing the other with less variation. So let's talk about this one pertaining to smoking. Correlation 
There is a correlation between cancer and smoking. We can look at graphs and see that there is a correlation. When people smoke more, they get more cancer. But smoking doesn't cause cancer. Smoking does not cause, by smoking a cigarette, you are not making the cells in your body divide more frequently. What you are doing is causing more DNA damage to your cells. As we accumulate DNA damage, which might be from more smoking, or it might be from something like an x-ray, or it might just be from living life normally. As you accumulate this DNA damage, which is caused by, can be caused by smoking, that causes cancer. So because smoking causes a lot of these, because smoking causes more um, DNA damage, it can be thought that smoking causes cancer, but smoking causes the DNA damage, which does cause cancer. Good? Good. So I believe that is all I really have to go over today. If you have any questions, feel free to message me or text me or just leave them in the comments and I will see them. If not, I hope that this video was in-depth enough because I'm thinking about it now and I'm realizing this was not a very long video, which is nice. But I feel like there was probably more I should have been covering and didn't. But that's okay. Um, yeah. All right, bye.